Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the meeting of the subcommittee on zoning and franchises. I'm council member Francisco Moya, the chairperson of the subcommittee. And today we are joined by council members Grudenchek, Richards, Reynoso, and Rivera. Uh, if you are here to testify, please fill out a speaker slip with the sergeant at arms indicating your full name, the application name or LU number, and whether you are in favor or against the proposal. We will begin this meeting with our hearing, starting with a pre-considered LU item C190029 ZMQ for the 14740 uh, 15th Avenue rezoning proposal relating to property in Council Member Valone's district in Queens. The applicant seeks approval for a zoning map amendment to map a C12 commercial overlay district within an existing R3A district along the south side of uh, 15th Avenue between 147th Street and 149th Street in Whitestone, Queens, and which would bring an existing building in, which would bring an existing building to two stories of commercial office into conformance with zoning. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, uh, and we have Jay Goldstein and Bill Milnerick. Thank you. Council, if you could please swear in the panel. Please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. Hi, uh, Yaakov Goldstein for the applicant, or Jay Goldstein. So, you guys introduce Anthony Romano, applicant. Speak into the mic. Did you just speak into the microphone? Push, Make sure that the, the button. button is pressed. <coughs> yeah. Anthony Romano is the applicant. William Elnarek, applicant. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. Yes. Yes. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning. Happy New Year, everybody, and thank you for having us today. My name is Jay Goldstein. I'm here on behalf of uh, 8850 Management LLC, uh, Anthony and Bill, who are the owners of 147-4015th Avenue in Queens. We're here before you today to ask for a zoning map amendment to create a C12 commercial overlay in an R3A zoning district. As you can see from the map, the proposed district would be 100 feet from 149th Street along 15th Road and 150 feet from 149th along 15th Avenue. The proposal before you is necessitated by the fact that my clients, unfortunately, in 2015 bought a property under the information um, that it was a commercial property. Subsequent to that, they found out that they could not, in fact, use it for their desired use. They are the end users. It's not a development. It's not a rental property. Um, in seeking ways to uh, handle this issue, we spoke to the city, and uh, they've advised us that we should pursue this rezoning, which would serve to legalize our building as well as the uh, properties along 149th. So the um, proposal before you includes four uh, tax lots. The tax lots include our property, a mobile station, two-story residential, as well as a eating and drinking establishment. The mobile station would not be legalized. They're existing under, an, under a BSA application. However, our use, as well as the um, eating and drinking establishment, would be legalizing the use and bringing it into more in line with what the current land use is for this area. Um, the area surrounding us has uh, commercial use and mixed use along the thoroughfare and as well as along the Cross Island Parkway. The remainder of the area is community facilities as well as residential buildings. As mentioned before, we have our property, which is the development site. There's the mobile station, which would not be impacted. The two-family residential, which is a new building, so we don't anticipate any change to that occupancy or use. And Jaeger House Restaurant, which has existed in this location for many, many years. So the application before you seeks to legalize that. We don't anticipate development under this application. Rather, it's just a method of which to help these individuals um, maintain their office in that building and, and put the property to productive use. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Just uh, two quick questions. And <clears throat> just once again, it, it, can you provide an overview of the previous use on the site and how they relate to the proposed commercial overlay? Okay, so um, historically, the building was built as a daycare, which is a community facility use. 
when the CFO was issued, it indicated that there were offices there. When this was, you know, since that time, it's been used as a paint storage and paint facility. It was used as a kitchen design firm, and there were other um, commercial uses. My clients operate a um, uh, building services uh, company, which sends out service workers to buildings all over the country, and they operate the call center, if you will, or the main office from this building. So they've been operating there since about 2015. It's a very small operation within the building. Um, the majority of their people don't actually work from the building, but they've been using this as their um, home base or their headquarters for their use. And we seek to retain that use at this location. Okay, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and the community board had a split vote? Right on this application, can you identify what were uh, their concerns and uh, how you've been uh, addressing them? So the initial, because we actually presented the community board a number of times. The only time that they had the split vote was at the very end, the last vote. Um, the first two hearings, there were no issues. At the last vote, one of the neighbors from the surrounding house, which is not as part of the uh, rezoning application, came and addressed and raised concerns about overdevelopment and overuse of the, of the street. Um, as a matter of fact, we re from the initial iteration of this rezoning, we reduced the, the, uh, the scale of the rezoning to address community board uh, concerns, and that's why the community board was supportive. Subsequent to the hearing, while we were standing in the room, we spoke to that neighbor, we addressed his concerns, explained the actual project. That neighbor had no more comments, no more complaints, and actually left supportive. When we got to the board president and city planning commission, the neighbor did not come, there was no opposition. So we believe that the split vote was because we didn't have a chance to respond on the record at the community board to that neighbor's concerns. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing uh, on this application. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Being Happy today. New Year. We will now hear pre-considered LU item C190267, uh, ZMQ, and N190266, uh, ZRQ, for the 22-60th 46th Street rezoning related to the property in Council Member Constantinidis' district in Queens. The applicant seeks approval for a zoning map amendment to rezone the block bounded by 23rd Avenue and Ditmars Boulevard and 45th Street and 46th Street by changing uh, the existing R4 and M11 district to R4, R6A district with a C23 commercial overlay along 45th Street uh, in the southern, uh, in the southwest, western portion of the block, as well as a related zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option two uh, and the workforce option. Together, these actions would facilitate the construction of a new mixed-use building uh, with eight-story uh, portions along both uh, street frontages uh, of, the, of the through block site, and as well as an approximately 250-seat uh, theater space and below-grade parking with approximately 105 spaces. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, uh, and I will now call the first panel. Jocelyn Skarinci, Sk did I say it right? <laughs> Sorry. And uh, Emmanuel uh, how, how do you? Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and uh, Paula Durang. All right. uh, sorry? You, you didn't get that one? Uh, Council, if you could please swear in the, the Please panel. raise your right hand and state your name for the record. Jacqueline Skarinci. Emmanuel Kokinakis. Paola Duran. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Moya and Council Members. My name is Jacqueline Skarinci of Ackerman LLP. On behalf of the co-applicants for this land use application, Mega Realty Holding LLC and the Pan Cyprian Association of America. I'm joined here today by Emmanuel Kokonakis of Mega Realty and also Hercules, Hercules Agrio, as well as Paula Duran from Hanek, the project's affordable housing administering agent. 
We are here today to present the proposed rezoning of Block 769, which will make the existing residential uses on the block conforming and or complying, and will facilitate the redevelopment of two manufacturing sites that are not currently consistent with the existing development on the block, with a new mixed-use development that includes affordable housing and a new home and theater for a nonprofit community group that has been in the community for decades. To orient you to the site, the project area is comprised of Block 769, which is bounded by Dittmar's Boulevard to the north, 23rd Avenue to the south, 45th Street to the west, and 46th Street to the east. The existing uses, which you can see in this proposed area, of, uh, in this actual aerial photograph, um, shows the Pasilli Manor Building, which is a six-story residential condominium condominium building with 201 units that was converted from the former Steinway Piano Factory in 2008. The building is overbuilt um, and within this existing R4 zoning district. Further south, there are also non-conforming uses. There is lot 39, which is improved with a one-story eating and drinking establishment for Joe's Garage, um, and the remainder of the block are residential buildings that are located within an M1 zoning district. To provide you with broader neighborhood context, west of the site is a uh, retail shopping mall. East of the site, you can see, is a 45-foot tall that rises without a setback storage facility. CubeSmart was recently developed within the M1 zoning district. Um, and then the just moving to our development site, which is just immediately adjacent to the Pasilli Manor building. It's two manufacturing buildings, one of which has been occupied by our client for over 20 years, Mega. It's their contracting business, which they will be relocating um, that business elsewhere. Um, and then on the 45th Street side is a plumbing supply business, which has been vacant. So um, there are no existing uh, um, manufacturing uses that are being used here today. Uh, just to show you what the existing experience is, uh, you see this residential development is adjacent to this blank wall, uh, desolate environment for for anyone, any pedestrians walking by. To give you the area context, um, this M11 zoning district north of the Grand Central Parkway is l literally an isolated M1 zoning district um, with very little. It's surrounded by mostly residential uses within the surrounding area. Here's the, the zoning change map. The map to the left shows the existing zoning today, um, which is an R4 district um, with an M11 on the southern portion of the block. And then we are proposing to rezone um, the M11 and R4 districts to an R4, R4 C23 on the southern portion of the block that will bring in the, the commercially existing commercial use into conformance and also um, bring in the lower density residential buildings into conformance. And then over um, our proposed site, we would be mapping an R6A, which would also bring the Pasilli building, which is currently out of compliance, into compliance. In addition to the rezoning actions, we are seeking a mandatory inclusionary housing text amendment. Uh, we are proposing both options two and the workforce option. The applicant here is proposing the MIH workforce housing option. Workforce option requires 30% of the residential floor area to be provided at an average of 115% AMI, with 5% of the residential floor area at 70% AMI, 5% at 90% AMI, and no unit exceeding 135% of AMI. No subsidy is permitted for income-restricted housing under this workforce housing option. Although the median household income in Astoria is approximately $60,000, the median for the wider Astoria area includes five of the city's largest NYCHA developments. 
the AMI for Steinway's neighborhood tabulation area from 2013 to 2017 has a median household income of approximately 70% AMI. However, the census tract directly affecting the project area is much higher at $79,700, approximately 80% of AMI. Additionally, 57.5% of the population within this neighborhood make between $47,000 and $163,000, which is the broad range of incomes that the project's affordable housing units will serve. The project will have income bands at 70%, 90%, and 135% AMI. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, 40.5% of households in Queens Community District 1 are rent burdened spending 35% or more of their income on rent. The affordable housing crisis in New York doesn't just reach the lowest income residents, which have received the bulk of the mayor's housing budget, but also to the middle class. The mayor's housing plan defines workforce housing as housing for those who provide essential services for the local economy, such as firefighters, teachers, nurses, or police officers, who may otherwise be priced out of the housing market in proximity to their place of employment. Middle income housing is essential to support our economy and the middle class, which increasingly cannot afford to live in our city. Additionally, the applicant has selected the workforce housing option here because market rents in, in this area reflect a moderate market condition. The workforce option was established to address policy concerns about the potential effects of mandatory affordability requirements in areas such as Steinway, where prevailing rents are sufficient to support construction at moderate rents needed by the middle class, but not the internal cross-subsidy of low-income low affordable rents. Now I'll turn it over to Emmanuel Kokonakis, who will discuss the proposed development and proposed workforce housing in more detail, as well as change to the project since it was certified into public review. Good morning. Um, as Jacqueline briefly described, the project consists of a through lot, so it's two building segments over a common base. Uh, the base of the building includes uh, a commercial uh, space that'll front on 45th Street, which is uh, complementary to the existing shopping center across the street and uh, drink, eating and drinking establishment next door. Um, the total unit count will be 88 units. This was at, after much feedback from the local community board. We initially went in with a proposal of a more, much more dense building with a heavier studio mix. Um, the community voiced a concern for wanting more family size units and no studios. Uh, so we went back with a mix of 88 units that are all ones, twos, and threes, with the majority over 60% being two and three bedroom units. Of the 88 units, 28 will be permanently affordable um, to middle income households. The building uh, amenities will include a fitness center, residence lounge, playroom, party room, office center, and a large landscape terrace in between the two. Uh, frontages of the building. Um, we've also signed an agreement with 32PJ to provide the uh, building service employees um, for the for the property. Uh, 6,000 of commercial on 45th Street, as uh, previously mentioned, and typically in our in our projects we put um, complementary residential uses, um, daycares, doctors' offices, fitness concepts, something that would fit well into the context of the neighborhood. Um, we're currently contemplating a 70-space garage. That was also another major community concern given um, the, the density for the, the neighborhood of providing ample parking, so this far exceeds the minimum required parking under zoning. And the uh, cultural component to the project is a 250-seat theater that will ha house, house the Pan Cyprian Association of America. Uh, it's an it's, uh, organization that's been in a story for over 40 years. Um, they currently have uh, their, their club on 31st Street and a story and have since outgrown that sub uh, substantially. Uh, this is a rendering from 46th Street. Um, you'll see uh, the building rises six stories and setbacks uh, for an additional two stories. You have the parking garage entrance and the community facility theater entrance on 46th. This is the view from 45th, which has the main residential entrance and also the commercial retail on the base there. This is a view of the terrace in between the two building segments. And this is an aerial view 
showing the, the two segments of the, of the building. Uh, to go into a little bit more detail about the theater, it'll be an 11,000 square foot to, uh, total facility um, that could, has a 250 seat theater component to it as well as can be used for many other uses. Um, there's a large lobby foyer area that could be used for art exhibitions and other cultural events. Um, the Pan Cyprian Association is a not-for-profit association. The theater would be used exclu exclusively for not-for-profit uses and would be open to other local not-for-profit groups to use on a short-term uh, base rental basis. Um, there are a few cultural divisions to the Pan Cyprian Association. They have a theater division, dance division, choir division. They currently don't have a space to house these groups to practice with. Mostly their participants are children that live in the, the neighborhood. Most of their um, constituents do live in the immediate area here. So, um, you know, they, they would be having practices during the week where this, the children would come after school hours and leave and would have roughly six major performances a year that would um, meet the capacity of the theater. This is a, an outline of the affordability levels that we're targeting for the project. Um, as you'll see, we have bands at 70, 90, and 135 percent AMI. Um, the majority of those units are two and three uh, bedroom units. I, th I think part of the argument for use, using the workforce option here is that um, we do have the ability to target dual income households having two, mostly two and three bedroom units. Uh, dual income households will be able to qualify for, for these AMI levels. We also have a very wide range of affordability from 47,000 a year to 163,000 a year. So it'll be open to a wide range of uh, residents that will be able to qualify. Um, next slide. And the affordable units would be administered by Hannock, who has um, been established in Astoria for a very long time, since 1972. And Paola can talk a little bit about the um, marketing and, and ongoing maintenance of the affordable units. Thank you. So, hi, my name is Paola Duran. I'm the director of housing for Hannock. And we will be working um, with the developer uh, in order to act as the marketing agent for the approximately 28 affordable units that are going to be, that are being proposed under this um, development. Uh, I just want to say that on behalf of the team and some of the seniors that are present here today, um, we're really happy to be able to collaborate with this project and we want to hear our voice to support the rezoning application for this project. We think that the middle middle income housing is really needed in Astoria and that's why we are we really are eager to see this project moving forward. Uh, Hannah will be working in two different areas towards the marketing and then the management of the affordable units. Um, towards the marketing of the process, um, towards the marketing of the MIH units. We've been doing this for a couple of years now. We're working with other developers uh, by administering the MIH units. And we usually do it doing like a large community outreach strategy. Uh, we've been in Astoria since um, 7, 1972. So we have a good range of organizations that we will be reaching out to just to make sure that everyone is informed about this opportunity for the MIH units. And we will be also working with the applicants um, to put the applications through Housing Connect and through the entire lottery process. Uh, HANAC is part of the HPD's Housing Ambassador Program since 2017, so we have a well-established um, office in Astoria where we receive the applications and we guide them through the process. So if they want to do either the, pi the paper application or the website application, we work with them and we've been doing that since 2017, so we are 100% sure that we should be able to do, secure all the MIH units for this project as well. Um, We've been working in Queens for decades and we are aware of the housing need in, on this area. So I think our role is going to complement the entire project and the other uh, sections of the project. Uh, so if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you, Paul. This slide here um, references the change in the unit distribution. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see our initial proposal to the community board 
with 135 units, the bulk of them being studios and one bedroom units, and the revised to the left of 88 units with the bulk being two and three bedroom units. Some additional street views here will have, the buildings will be set back significantly off of the, the streetscape, uh, roughly 10 feet, allowing for a landscape uh, front yard experience for the local community members so they won't, the buildings won't be overbearing on the street. We've done a, a great deal of community outreach in addition to several meetings with the community board. We um, received over 1,000 petition, uh, petition signatures in support of the project. 152 of them are within a three to four block radius of the project. Um, we've received over 10 uh, letters of support from local businesses as well who are all, are all in favor of the project. We've had many no, uh, local cultural groups express their support of the project as well. Um, and we also have some immediate neighbors um, that are in favor of the project and are here to testify. Um, we've also done some outreach to the local schools um, who've expressed um, some theater programming that they currently don't have a space for, so some collaboration there in, in making this, the theater space available to the local schools as well. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Just a, a couple of questions, and if we can just uh, go back again to just walk me through, again, the justification for the MIH uh, workforce option and why it was appropriate for this neighborhood. Sure. So the, the market AMI for Astoria is roughly run 150% AMI. So compared to other uh, neighborhoods where there would be a stark difference between um, you know, the, the workforce option to be cross-subsidized with the market rate units. There isn't a, a great disparity here for, that the market units are that much more higher than the affordable units. So there's, there's not that much cross-subsidization um, from the market rate units here. Also, the, with the income bands we're targeting and our unit mix being mostly twos and three bedrooms, it gives you a, 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 the ability for dual-income households middle-income households to apply for the units with family units. Um, are there any other points? That, uh, sure. I mean, just to give you um, some examples of the starting salaries so that you could see what the, the dual incomes that Manny's referencing. Like for a starting MTA, employee makes $43,500, and a starting salary for a school teacher is $56,000. Together, they make $100,000. They would qualify for the units at 90% AMI. Um, and just even further, a public school teacher is making approximately $56,000. Um, starting their salary is $75,000. Together, they make close to $135,000. They'd be qualifying for the 115% AMI units. Um, so I think you know there is a strong need for workforce housing in general um, that that supports the, the middle class. This project is not requesting public subsidy. It's, it's a privately financed project. And in addition to that, we're also constructing a community theater that's part of the overall project program. And it's a huge benefit to the overall community. And also, I want to point out, it's not that large of a building being 88 units. We're not looking for a very high density here. We're only going for an R6A, giving the relatively low density in the immediate area. So it's not, we don't have that many units to bolster cross subsidization. I just want to say something in because we receive uh, people from not only for CB1 but for the entire borough and they're looking for larger units. Sometimes when we are renting our projects, we have to reject some applicants because you are exceeding the income band, but because they're looking for larger units. So I think this will be a good complement for that. Thank you. The community board had a number of concerns. Uh, can you tell us how you've addressed these concerns uh, through changes uh, to the proposed development? Before that, I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by uh, Council Member Lansman. Okay. So I, I think the, the first major concern that was raised in our initial meetings was the unit count and the density. So we revised, went from 135 units with a heavy studio and one bedroom concentration to 88 units with a heavy two and three bedroom family concentration of units. 
There are other concerns related to the bulk in, uh, of the building and the height of the building. Um, we set back the building 10 feet on, on both street frontages to not have this, the, the bulk overbearing. We do have a contextual building immediately next door in the Pasilli building, which is roughly within the same height range of our building. Um, so we feel that our building is contextual and given the setbacks um, will not be uh, an overburden on the street experience there. We're also gonna landscape the uh, front both frontages of the building to allow for uh, an additional public amenity um, in that setback area. Um, other concerns were related to the parking, <coughs> um, given the, the theater components, so we sought to seek uh, um, outside parking availability on nights that we do have uh, theater performances where it'll be at the mass maximum capacity so we don't overburden the street parking in the area. Uh, we also looked at increasing our parking size from 70 units to 80 parking spaces to better accommodate everything within the proposed building. Okay. And uh, why is the Pasilli building being rezoned here? And is the building fully occupied by residential use? So the Pasilli building is part of the rezoning because it's currently a non complying building, it's in an R4 district. Um, it was converted from manufacturing to residential by a, a variance. The, oh, I'm sorry. Good. It, it was a, through a BSA variance. Got it. Uh, so did the rezoning to the R4 not allow uh, enough residential density to fully occupy the building? No, it's an existing non-complying building, but this will bring it into compliance. The R6. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and there are commercial uses on the ground floor. I think actually the community board's local offices are in, at the base of that building. Right. Thank you. Questions? Council Member Reynoso. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, who is the uh, nonprofit that you guys would be partnering with in this project? Hanek. Hanek. Yes. Um, Hanek, what is the uh, population or the demographics of the people that you serve? We serve seniors, youth, and children. Seniors, youth, and children. Um, uh, demographics as in uh, race makeup? Do we know um, their ethnic backgrounds? I think we, we really cover a little bit of everyone. So. Okay. To give you a very specific, are you looking for something specific so I can give you the answer? No, no, I just want to know like uh, income, like the income of the people that you service mostly. Are they, I guess if you're not for profit, are you serving like low income? Yes, mostly residents? low income and some middle income families as well for a variety of different mm -hmm. social services mainly. All right, so 75% of the affordable housing units under the option three would be for people making $163,000 a year. So a lot of people wearing green shirts here, and I would love to know how many of them you think make $163,000 a year um, that wouldn't even be able to live in this apartment building. 75% of the units, uh, a one bedroom going for 2,570, comparing prices for a one bedroom that are, are comparable to Williamsburg and Bushwick housing, as opposed to this being um, in, a, in a different part of the city of New York that has a, a housing market um, uh, that doesn't seem to be as, as lucrative, let's say, as the waterfront properties in, in Long Island City or Williamsburg. Um, can I ask the developer, though, um, what are the prices of the regular market rate units going to be in this property? Right, so they'll be roughly around 150% AMI. So it's about a 15%, 15, 20% discount to the, the rent levels that you see there. So a one bedroom will probably go for 27, 2800? Roughly, yes. So 2800, okay. Are you guys aware about the fact that the city of New York is one of the most segregated cities in all of America? Yes. Do, do you know um, uh, one of the, the, the reasons that is? The, um, or do you think housing has anything to do with the segregation? Absolutely, we, we build a lot of affordable housing throughout the city. Um, we would like to do more affordable here. If we had more density to, to do it, we would absolutely do it. We've done other affordable projects in Queens throughout the boroughs, that's, that's the bulk of our work, and we're, we're very familiar. It's, it comes down to 
the the density and and also the land acquisition prices associated with these properties that are yeah but the land acquisition prices is a, a, a bet you made and that's that's a that's a personal problem so i don't want to talk about land acquisition just because you pay too much for it doesn't mean that we got to suffer and have people pay uh three thousand ninety three dollars for a two-bedroom apartment um so um i do want to ask though uh subsidies from the city of new york you've rejected subsidies from the city of new york i'm sorry Subsidies? Yes. No from the subsidy. city of New York? There's no Sorry, if, if, if folks can uh, silence their uh, mobile phones, uh, yeah. greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Su subsidies. Are you taking any subsidies from the city of New York? No. Not Why for not? this project. Why not? The, the scale of the, of the project would not fall within any HPD programs. So, so you believe that HPD wouldn't have funded any affordable housing, uh, any deeper affordable housing in this project have you did you ask hpd i guess is the question I'm we we're familiar with the hpd term sheets it would not fall under any of the the categorized hpd term sheets we have not specifically spoken about this project no but for 28 units um we're not aware of a of an, an hpd program that would work for this type of project right 28 units but maybe you could add more units than 28 out of the 88 to be affordable, I guess is what I'm saying. I, and uh, I just want to be very clear. I think that this is a, a, a project that is not going to serve uh, a crisis that we have in our city. We have over 70,000 people living in homeless shelters. Um, the, you, the workforce option should have never been an option that should have been included in MIH, um, I believe, from the get. Uh, there's just, as a member of the subcommittee, as a member of the Committee on Land Use, and as a member of the City Council, I will not be voting on any project that uses the workforce option. It just doesn't speak to um, you being a partner in addressing the housing crisis that we have in the city of New York. And the crisis um, does not fall on people making $112,000 to $163,000 a year. The people that are suffering make less than $58,000 a year, which you would only have five units being constructed for them. So I just don't think that this project is in line with our goals that we're trying to reach when we talk about affordability and affordable housing. Um, and the fact that you guys would even um, have a, a whole lineup, a whole rationale as to why the workforce option makes sense is very is concerning, especially for a, a developer like Mega, who has done um, affordable housing work in the past and understands these dynamics much more intently than other people. Um, so again, I would advise that you move away from the workforce option. Um, the community board specifically said that they would prefer option one so the community board is also telling you that your analysis as to how much affordability that you're putting forth in this project doesn't fall in line with even their wants. So the community itself is asking for more affordability. So that's just a recommendation that I would give to you um, and would recommend that you never come in here with a workforce option as one of the options for affordable housing because it just doesn't make any sense. Thank you for my time. Chair. Thank you. Just for the record before I turn it over to Council Member Grudenchik, uh, Hannick does wonderful work with communities of all colors. They're actually in Corona, Queens, where I represent. Uh, I actually worked there when I was a kid uh, over in Astoria. They do wonderful work and they've been good partners uh, with us. So I just wanted to uh, put that on the record. Uh, I just want to turn it over now to Councilmember Grudenchik. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I do want to second, um, having worked in the borough uh, for over 30 years in, in and around government, uh, I do know the great work that Hannick does um, and continues to do on a daily basis, uh, helping people from all walks of life. So I want to thank you for that work. And um, I notice you have a theater in this building. Can you tell me how much the cost of the theater is, how much it's pushing up? I, I mean, not that I'm objecting because my brother's a working actor, but uh, I'm just curious as to how much that pushed the price up here. The, the theater, the total cost of the theater will be roughly four and a half to five million dollars. That's a pretty expensive build out. Um, I have to disagree with my esteemed colleague from Brooklyn and Queens, Mr. Reynoso. Um, I do believe that there is a need for workforce housing in the city. Uh, we have a lot of people in my district that leave and go to Nassau and Suffolk County simply because they can't find housing. And while I certainly agree with him that um, we need to be doing more uh, for people who cannot find homes, and that's generally poorer people, we also need to remember that there is a crisis uh, for people such as firefighters and police officers and nurses. So um, I 
you know, I, I, I just want to put that on the record, Mr. Chairman. Um, you're, as you, you are not getting any subsidies from the city or other than the rezoning, which is not technically a subsidy, but it is. Correct. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your testimony today. Uh, I'd like to call up the next panel. Uh, Constantine uh, Yanudin, Panos Anomopoulos, Frank Scavetta, uh, Brendan Levy, I just want to remind the panel, you have two minutes for your testimony. Okay. Is this on to 20% yeah. anything just, or? Is yeah, it? just I, announce, you can announce your name and then you yeah, can. Yeah, I'm Konstantinos Yanoudis. Uh, I'm a general director of an opera company in, uh, in Astoria for the past eight years and I've been a member of the pan Cyprian Association for 30 years since I came to America. Uh, as a producer, as a conductor, I want to reiterate how uh, unbelievably important would be to have a real professional theater in Astoria. Uh, if you look at the theaters in Astoria, and I work in every, I dare say, even event little halls that have been producing different events and galas and opera companies, I will tell you the only theater that exists in Astoria is the Sinatra Theater. But the Sinatra Theater is a high school, and it serves the, the community, and this is not a criticism, it serves the, the children, uh, and the students of, uh, of the high school. Uh, and I am forced as a producer and as a general director of a professional opera company to go to Manhattan. Same, uh, with the same way, uh, I would like to tell you that most people that I know, that they want to uh, uh, go and experience a professional production, uh, theater, dance, a concert, pop music, where do they go? They go to Manhattan, uh, most of them, because there's not a real uh, theater that can actually provide that, you know, this, this uh, professional productions for the community, and our story, I think, needs it very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Panos. If you can just uh, oh, can speak into the okay. microphone. Yep. Well, I'm the baritone of the uh, choir, so I might not need it. Could, my name is Panos Adamopoulos, and uh, I am a business owner in Astoria and longtime supporter of cultural events. Uh, for the last six years, I've been the president of the Athenian Society of New York, a 501c3 organization that produces a lot of educational and cultural programs. For the last 10 years, I have been the vice president and the artistic director of the Athens Square Committee on 30th Avenue and 30th Street, where every summer we produce programs, concerts, uh, theatrical plays for uh, Italian, Greek, and Spanish community. Next year we'll have also for Arabic community as well. But the uh, thing that is lacking besides the three months of the summer, and that's also due to the weather, if we can have all 12 concerts, we need a place where we can house ourselves during the winter times. Um, as a business owner, I'm here to support this project because I also represent other business owners in Astoria who cannot be here today, cannot take the day off. And I believe that, as the panel said before, that uh, we need affordable housing in Astoria. We need people to come, live, uh, flourish, uh, raise their families, and I think that they will be a major economic contributing factor. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Frank Scavetta. I was born in Astoria 62 years ago, and I live right up the block from the project. I got married 40 years ago when I bought that house when the block was empty factories, abandoned cars, and over the years I've seen a supermarket and a mall be built, and there was a lot of resistance. The neighborhood got better. I saw the Pastilli building go up. The neighborhood got better. And now I want to see this project go up. I have, through all my windows, I look at this project, whatever window you look at in my house. I have four homes within this project that they're building. Two of them butt right up against the property. 
one which my 86-year-old mother lives in, and two doors away, my daughter, her husband, and my two beautiful grandchildren. I don't want nothing bad to happen to Astoria, and I feel it'll be a great thing to bring the neighborhood alive. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brendan Levy. I work with the uh, Queen's Chamber of Commerce. I'm going to read a letter uh, written by Thomas Gretsch, the president and CEO of the Queen's Chamber, into the record. Uh, good morning, Tom Gretsch, CEO of the Queen's Chamber. Uh, the Queen's Chamber fully supports this proposed rezoning in Astoria. More than a dozen local businesses that are in the uh, direct vicinity of the proposed development have expressed support of the project from the bar that's located right next door to the restaurants, bakery, dry cleaners, and others. Since many of them cannot be here today as small business owners, uh, they cannot take a day off uh, to be here. However, I know they have deep roots in a story. They care deeply about the community that they live in and that they've invested in. Uh, and of course, they want the best possible outcome. New housing for working families will revitalize this section of Astoria, which is desolate at night and prone to vandalism. Each day, middle-class families are pushed out of the city, adversely impacting small businesses as well, which, of course, uh, the small businesses, of course, uh, who we represent at the chamber, uh, they help contribute to make Astoria, you know, such a desirable neighborhood that it is. Now that we have the opportunity to offer permanently affordable housing, specifically creating, uh, created for dual-income families where an MTA employee and uh, a nurse may share a home that's well-built, near affordable, uh, uh, near transportation, and great schools. So we hope to welcome this proposed development and rezoning that will not only offer housing for working families, but it in turn will help support the small business community in Astoria as well. Great. Thank, thank you all for your testimony here today. I appreciate your time. I'm going to call up the next panel, uh, Mark Espinoza, Richard uh, Kuzam, oh boy, <laughs> Efrosini, <laughs> Tsukas, yes. Very good. thank you, Perfect. and Karina uh, Duramanis. I can begin with you, Mark. Hello. Good morning. My name is Mark Espinoza. I'm a, I'm a cleaner, and I've been a member of 32BJ for about 12 years. I'm here today on behalf of my union to share our support of this project. New York's economy is hard on, hard, on, hard on working families, and we believe that in order to create a more balanced New York, new developments should come with commitments to create prevailing wage building service jobs. We are pleased to tell you that Mega Realty Holding LLC has made a credible commitment to providing prevailing wage jobs to the future property service workers at this site. Additionally, we know this development to be a special development because it has a significant amount of multiple bedroom units. It is, often, it is not often that a project like this goes through ULERP. Having access to bigger and more spacious units means more space for growing families. 32BJ represents 4,500 workers who live and work in the community district. We believe that new development needs to cater to families at a range of affordability levels, including not only the lowest income families, but also moderate income people, like many in our membership. We are supportive of a vision for this project that integrates workforce housing so that working people like cleaners and porters can continue to have a place in this community and to live near where they work. We believe that this development team has a vision to invest in this community and we are happy to support this plan. We respectfully request you approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Richard Kuzami. I'm the president of the Old Astoria Neighborhood Association. I'm also a member of CB1. And I want to begin by clarifying my no vote uh, on the community board. I also am on the land use committee. Um, and I want, because of the way the vote was structured, some of the no votes were people that were completely against the project, and some of the no votes were people that were in favor of the project. So I want people to understand that the negative vote had, was not clarified correctly. And I did vote in favor of it. So I, I'd like you to know that first of all. 
Okay, uh, and in terms of um, some of their findings, uh, the reasons I did this was, number one, uh, the stipulation that the Pastilli building not be considered when assessing context. I think that flies in the face of logic. When combined with a recently completed public storage facility across the street from it, I feel that the proposed building is completely within context. You can't ignore the elephant in the room. It makes no sense. Uh, the parking, I think that the parking actually, they, they're actually providing parking above what's required in the zoning. So, and I also, I know that they are going out and trying to uh, find additional parking on performance nights. So I think this is a big positive. Um, the M1 use, this is something that ne really needs to be considered, I think. If for some reason uh, Mega was to sell the property, and there's so much that could be built there as of right, it would be much more onerous to the neighborhood. I mean, they could have hotels, homeless shelters, public storage, warehouses, manufacturing, offices, and they, it would not be within, go within the Euler process. The community would have no say. So I think it's important that that be kept in mind. Um, also, the arts. There's a, um, a movement out there of something they call art washing. When you can, okay, you can there's a, a movement called art washing, um, and this is somehow saying that uh, developers are using the arts in order to get their evil uh, desires. Okay, this is I'm finding this uh, out quite a bit out there, and I just think that private investment in the arts is what fueled the Renaissance. It kept it keeps government con controlling what's acceptable. Okay, so that, and also I just think that the workforce option needs to be readdressed in order to more fully be compliant with neighborhood needs. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Efrosini Tsoukas, and I am here representing the Greek Cultural Center. Uh, I am a resident of uh, Astoria since 68, and the center is active in Astoria since 1974. So we have seen the changes that have come in Astoria. And um, uh, one change we have witnessed ourselves is uh, where we began by being a, a completely Greek cultural center and our resident uh, theater groups were uh, all Greek. Right now we have a resident theater group that consists of people of seven, from 17 different countries. And that's a reflection of what is going on in Astoria. Astoria um, has, uh, a, a, I'm here to speak mainly for the need for the theater. Astoria has two factors that uh, uh, um, add to the need for the theater. One is that uh, uh, w there are a lot of Greeks in Astoria, and to Greeks, theater is as opera is to Italians. And we have at least 10 groups, theater groups in Astoria active at this time, and dozens of uh, performances every year, and, um, and no theaters. And the, the, the second group is the after the Kaufman studios were built, the influx we have of artists in Astoria. And now that uh, De Niro bought the, the, the Steinway building also, and he, from what I hear, he's gonna build studios there, I can imagine that more and more artists will be coming to Astoria because of the proximity, perhaps, to Manhattan. We see that in our theater, too. We have a small um, black box theater of 60 seats, and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, people coming, uh, we have, uh, we're renting it out now to uh, groups of, of Broadway groups and, and people are coming from Manhattan to, to see these uh, shows. And, oh, and the, um, oh God. And, and the, um, the other um, important thing for the, for the, the theater is that it is the, Right now we have a theater production that we have, in order to get a room for it, our own theater was too small. We either had to go to Manhattan, which is too expensive, because we, we want to provide affordable uh, a theater in, uh, in Astoria. And we have to go to Corona Park Theater, that's the only other option we had, which has no public transportation going to it. It's a, the, there is no other theater in Astoria. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Karina Deramanis. I am a lifelong resident of Astoria, born and raised in fact. Um, I also have grown my insurance business there. Uh, my family had their business there for 30 years. Um, I still do. And um, I'm a new mom. And my husband and I are temporarily living in Jamaica and looking to relocate back to Astoria. And surprisingly, our apartment searches have yielded few results that meet our criteria. Um, and I think that this new development in 46 and Dittmars would be amazing for us to be near transportation, near daycare, near shops, everything I need. Um, parking, which is a great plus. The theater, which is a great plus. Um, and I know that a lot of people, you know, will say, buy a two-family house in Astoria because that's what is there currently and that is just not the case anymore. Um, it's They're out of reach, it, they're not affordable um, and we're a dual you know income family, middle-class family and we're looking for a great place to live and I think that this would be a great place to raise my daughter. I want to come back um, and bring her back and continue my business there. Great, thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. Uh, I want to bring up the last panel, uh, Effie and Tonia. And Peter Vautsinas. Good morning. My name is Effie Antonio, and I'm a president of the theatrical of, of, the, of the theatrical division and principal association. I'm going to read this letter on behalf of my daughter who is a vice principal in the neighborhood, but she couldn't attend because she has to be in school. As a lifelong resident of the Astoria Didmas area, and also a teacher serving the same community, I believe that the residential development and Hellenic Culture Center will be a long-term investment for our community. A household moving into a new community generally spends about three-fifths of his income on goods and services sold in the Logan stores causing an economic ripple that permanently increases the level of economic activity for local business owners. The list of goods and services affected include groceries, home improvement, beauty salons, clothing, fitness centers, school supplies, and so on. Area business benefits from increased patronage, allowing them to increase income, job availability, and most purchase made from local vendors. As an educator that works and lives in the same community, the zone schools, where where this development is being built is underutilized and has had a decrease in student population. Declines like this can ultimately lead to a school closure and influx of students attending other school areas in the area. More families moving into the residential development will increase enrollment, save teaching jobs, and will ultimately benefit an already struggling school. Lastly, the Hellenic Culture Center that will be developed on the ground floor will promote culture and arts to the whole community. Activities of a culture center are necessary for growth and provide unique experience to the community. The Hellenic community needs a facility in which to sing, perform, play games, make music and art, develop talent, teach techniques, share ideas and learn from other creators and performers' way to express life richness. Culture centers are landmarks of the community that provide a place for education, holiday gatherings, lectures, activities, philanthropic, and everyday fun. I hope you consider all of these positive factors and reasons why I feel that residential building on the Hellenic Culture Center will be beneficial for the Astoria community. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Peter. I'll be speaking for Eddie Masterson, who's a neighbor of the project. My name is Eddie Masterson. I live at 226646 Street, right next door to the proposed development. I am in full support of the proposal. I have lived on 46th Street for more than 20 years. During this time, I witnessed storage facilities, warehouses, trucks, and graffiti overwhelm our block. These buildings do not add to our quality of life. They only take away from it. A new residential building and theater would bring new life, culture, and opportunity for us to live on an actual residential street, one where families can get to know each other and neighbors could make friends, instead of an industrial zone. My son is an NYC firefighter who is searching for an apartment. This building would be perfect place for a young man at his income level. Please support the rezoning. Thank you. 
Thank you both Thank for you. your testimony you. today. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close a public hearing on this application. Both applications that we heard today will be laid over. Uh, this concludes today's meeting, and I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, and of course the council and land use staff uh, for their hard work and attending here today. This meeting is hereby adjourned.